Welcome to Advanced Media's special podcast series introducing the key themes of Cine Tomorrow, 2024's community event serving as an intersection of digital cinema, virtual production, and sustainability in media and entertainment. I am Razan Takash, a filmmaker and head of film at SA Dubai, and I'm here with Mark Hobbs Hobson. Um, Mark is an international award-winning cinematographer and ACS member with over 15 years of experience. Uh, from Sydney's local music scene to feature films and commercial projects in Europe and the Middle East, Hobbs has won several cinematography awards from the AC ACS and various festivals around the world. Join us as we explore lens optics, storytelling, and the dynamic world of cinematography with Mark Hobbs Hobson. Mark. How are you? G'day, Razan. How are you doing? I'm good. I really struggle with that ACS. Yeah, that's a bit confusing. <laughs> the ASC, ACS, the AEC. Yeah. There's so many uh, guilds and, and associations. It's, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to start off with the dreaded question of what lens do I use since you're our optics guy? So how do you choose the right lens for the job and how does that choice affect uh, the storytelling in any film? Well, um, it really all comes down to the script and the story. So yeah, I mean, the first thing I would do when I get into a project is always address the script. You would read the script first and really dive into the story as a reader um, and then do a second pass of the script uh, as a technical breakdown and really grab the aesthetics of each scene, um, talk with the director about the character development, what he's looking for, and then make a decision based on that and offer suggestions. Because at the end of the day, the director will make the final call. Um, he's trusting you on your vision, but perhaps he's a camera savvy guy and he has a specific vision as well. So um, I always come to story first and then um, director, and then I'll start taking a look at sequences. So, mm. um, you know, if it, we've got a low, low light scene or a lot of low light scenes, of course, we'll opt for faster lenses. Mm. Um, if we need to get coverage and we've got, you know, no budget um, and we need to get it in a short amount of time, maybe grab a zoom because then you've got a variation of focal lengths that you can just grab on the fly. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, you always come back to the story, but there's little elements that can change the decision down the road. And mm. um, there's things like environmental properties of, of, you know, are you going for big wide panoramas or are you in really tight rooms, things like that. You still want to maintain depth and, and the scope of uh, scalability in scenes. So uh, yeah. always come back to story, but you will tweak things along the road. And filmmaking is a collaboration business, right? So. It's all about throwback between yourself, the director, even production design. Yeah, you know? and practicality seems to play a part in it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah, for me, like production design, you spend so much money on it. You want to see it as well in the frame. So there are little decisions that you want to make um, on your depth and things as well and what you can use. So again, just coming back to the story, what works for your story, uh, your budget and your time constraints of um, production, I think. I think that's where the lens choice comes from. So yeah, yeah no, it all depends on what. Yeah, and it's also the relationship between the lens and the camera that also plays a role, I think, uh, uh, aesthetically yeah, I mean, and technically. Yeah, I mean, format-wise, yeah. Obviously, because we've got Super 35, Super yeah. 16, uh, Vista Vision, full frame now. It's very accessible um, to all filmmakers. I mean, like we were just talking about Red uh, yesterday and how their cameras have really played onto the market and have been accessible to indie filmmakers because of their price point. And indie filmmakers now have an access to all sorts of uh, image circles and, and formats. So, um, yeah, it, it really plays down to that. And again, come back to the story. Always come back to the script. Um, it, it's the most important thing in, in anything. Yeah, and I think, you know, in recent years, we've been able to achieve the cinematic aesthetic with, with cameras like that and uh, being able to use these cinema lenses, I think, is uh, essential. Um, you know, there's traditional techniques of, of making films and it's been a certain way for a very long time, but recently there's been all these different trends and it's been changing, it's been changing so much. Um, how do you balance between those two things, the classic way of doing things versus, you know, the new digital age and the new trends that we're seeing coming up in cinematography recently? Story. It comes back to story. <laughs> it always comes back to the script. And um, I mean, it's fantastic where technology has moved. Um, you know, we've, we've got such access to beautiful tech these days. And I was just at IBC uh, last year in September, and it was amazing to see Asian products, how much they've caught up to the Germans, how much they've caught up to the Americans, you know. Um, and again, the accessibility to everybody. So, I mean, we have all these beautiful tools and we, we have all these RE Trinities and we have all these remote heads and things and people want to do fancy spins or, you know, crazy uh, fast push-ins. And But then again, does it suit the story? So in a narrative case, you really got to come back to the script. If it's a music video, you can go ballistic and, and really, you know, have some visual elements that blow your mind because that's what a music video is, right? It's a visual experience, a montage yeah. experience. But um, 
again, it has to suit the, the theme, has to suit the energy, um, what's coming from that music video. But um, being a narrative guy, I always come back to the script. And I've always said that there's nothing more powerful than uh, a beautifully composed and blocked scene. You've blocked it well and just a fixed tripod and, and the right focal length, right field of view. Um, you can work so much power in that because if you can hold the audience in the story without noticing the cinematography, I think that's the most powerful thing because you don't want to weigh the audience away from the story. You want to keep them in the story. I think that applies for a lot of technical elements in film is that most um, technical uh, elements if they're invisible, then they're done right, you know, and I think exactly. it applies to a lot of things, uh, including this. Um, with all this, you know, evolution and change and, and, and things that we're experiencing, we've kind of moved into digital cinema. Can you give us, you know, for somebody like me who's, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert in optics at all, um, how have lenses changed now, especially now that we've adapted so much to digital filmmaking? Well, I mean, there's a few different things. I mean, obviously now we're in the digital age and again, the accessibility of products to uh, indie filmmakers. Um, lenses on, uh, we've got uh, mirrorless cameras, um, mm. which are quite accessible. You can put uh, mount adapters down now and put you know, a $30,000 lens on a $2,000 DSLR. So um, we've got this accessibility of, of indie gear versus pro gear that are now merging together. Um, but also scientifically, the way lenses react, you know, it's an alteration of light. It, it hits your front element and what comes out the other end has been altered. And of course, um, a digital sensor also reacts different to an, a celluloid, right? So um, a digital sensor is glass itself and that light, that alteration of light from the lens still has to pass through that glass onto the photo site. So um, it's going to react differently as to a celluloid will. So Okay, there are elements where we're getting quite close uh, digitally. Technology, again, a beautiful thing that has opened up. Um, but yeah, I think when you're doing your lens testing, and I was mentioning this uh, yesterday in the optics workshop, um, it's not just the lens that, that plays a role in your visual and how things look. It's also the imager. Um, what medium are you shooting on? Because that can also change the characteristics of lenses. And um, we did a test with the Zine Meisters, which were fantastic uh, yeah. lenses and their prosumer level. But seeing those uh, lenses on two different imagers, um, it was crazy, the, the characteristics that changed. All the mediums were controlled, same T-stops, uh, ASA ratings, uh, distance to subject. Um, but yeah, it was interesting to see how light passing through the lens changes once it hits the imager. So you've got to think of that scientific aspect um, of the digital and analog, how, how things are changing and um, how a sensor reacts now into light. That's interesting, I mean, how, how what kind of effect do you think it has on the way films look nowadays? Like, is it, is it, do you think, like, there's a lot of people who are still, you know, holding on to the old ways and holding on to, you know, film. And uh, there's a lot of film directors out there who are proponents of still shooting on film and maintaining. Uh, but then again, you know, digital cinema has its own upsides, right? And bringing in this accessibility you're talking about. But mm. in terms of its overall impact on storytelling, what kind of impact do you think it has? Digital? Yeah. Well, I think the, the fact that you can, I mean, I don't like overshooting stuff, but yeah. directors these days are overshooting stuff and they're overshooting and overshoot. But I think because they get that more uh, time on set or more time to actually record their image, um, they're able to get maybe an alteration to, the, you know, let's get a variation of this, let's get a variation of that. Whilst if they were, you know, restricted to a film stock in like a thousand feet, they're limitless. You know, they, they, they stop at a limit and, ah, oh, we're out, you know. Yeah. The cans out, roll out, we, we're done for the day, you know, the stuff like that. So I think um, they can alter a scene a little bit more. They've got that freedom. Of course, maybe that's a bad thing. Um, I've seen, I've been on sets where directors will uh, shoot and they're shooting stuff that they know they will never use simply because they're on digital. If, if we were back on a celluloid, they wouldn't be uh, doing that. Yeah. <laughs> the producer would be killing them, you know? Unless um, Martin Scorsese used to shoot yeah. reels and reels of, of films. But um, I think, yeah, and that's the thing. Like I, I, when we were working on film, you would rehearse and block and block and rehearse before you would fire away, you know? Um, and yeah, being on digital, you, you don't have to worry about that now. And I think, yeah, I think people are kind of let go off the leash a little bit. And as I said, um, especially in commercials, you know, clients are, are horrible. Let's get a variation of this, a variation of that. And you know they're not going to use it. They know they're not going to use it. So, yeah, I think digital has opened up some, some things which are good. Um, you might get some art by accident in those variations. But 
again, sometimes you're just wasting time on set, mm. knowing you're not uh, going to use anything. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's bring it back to you. Yeah. Um, we've gone on to a... We're, we're, when we're discussing film, and the, again, yeah. the, the digital versus film is always an important aspect of it. But I want to bring it back to you and to uh, optics here and lenses. What are your favorite lenses to use? Do you have any favorites? I know like it's based on the story and the circumstance and the practical, but do you have any favorites? Do you have any go-to? I, I mean, it, it depends on the story, again. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, every cinematographer is different. Every story is different. Uh, yeah. Even directors have a big say in some of the lenses. Um, myself, uh, I, I like a clean image. Um, sometimes I like a bit of aberrations, you know, maybe something that's uh, got no coatings on it. You get a bit of veiling flare and a bit of, a bit of blooming happening. Um, if it works for the story, but in general, I find myself looking for a cleaner kind of shot. Um, I rarely use cosmetic filters yeah. uh, in front of lens un unless it's needed. Um, so that usually brings me into the cook range, but without anything cosmetic, I like like the cook creamy look. Yeah. Um, but of course, if there's budget, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> That's also an important. Yeah, factor. I mean, <laughs> and I like I bounce between anamorphic and spherical time to yeah. time. Um, you know, if it's if it's more of an indie feel and there isn't budget for something tailored like that, uh, I, as I said, I just did the research and development for um, Zine and the new yeah. Meister series, which are bloody fantastic. Yeah. Like they are sharp. That the consistency across the focal lengths of of color, um, distortion, the kind of aberrations, the sharpness has been really amazing. Like um, they've done, they're a huge step. They've gone from a, a consumer level based product and they're punching out this just above prosumer. So. On that kind of indie scene, um, I would totally roll with them. Uh, again, they're quite a, a new lens and yeah. um, people know them from that consumer market, but where they are moving uh, in, in their high-end products, it's something people should test out because I, I did something in Prague with them um, and I would totally use these on a narrative because all focal lengths are consistent. And again, when storytelling, you want to keep people in the story. And I mean, some lenses, vintage lenses, you might get different looks between focal lengths, but being a guy that likes consistency, um, they held together really well. So, yeah, I think they're my kind of two playing out areas um, so far. You know, I've, I've worked with many types of lenses, but I think these are the ones that I, I go back to time to time more often. Um, and I think in the region too, yeah. because it's a commercial heavy region, the yeah. cook look gets yeah, played out clean, a lot. Yeah, the clean, pristine, like, you know, like the, the soft, creamy soft, yeah, kind yeah. of look. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the region kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, has there ever been like a you know an instant where you a specific choice of lens really affected a project, made it more successful, solved the problem? Anything you can think of that you've actually experienced? Um, well, I mean, I guess there kind of has been, but again, it it suited the story. It hasn't really solved the problem. It mm. solved um, pulling out the right thing from the story. I guess the the biggest thing that solves problems a lot is zooms, mm. um, zoom lenses. And you know, I work a lot with Fujinon pre-misters because they're, they're beautiful lenses. And uh, when we shoot car commercials, yeah. it, it's like my go-to. I, I would hate having to get out of the car all the time on the Russian arm, my assistant changing lens, but having a zoom gives you that flexibility of focal length. But the, the pre-misters are dead sharp. The color is, is beautiful. The, what it's pulling back into the sensors, it's, it's amazing. So. I think it solves a problem of time, um, budget, and, and just getting your coverage within a, a time space of, you know, 12 hour shoot day. So um, I think problem solving wise, uh, Zooms really play in, play it out there. And the pre misters um, really do a fantastic job of that. For cinematographers now that are looking to you know, up and coming, they're trying to up their game, uh, especially in optics. Uh, what advice do you have? Test, test, absolutely test. Um, I think uh, testing is something that kind of uh, frightens like people jumping into the game because they don't know what they're looking for. But I think you know what you're looking for. You're just scared to get on the gear, but go in and test and, and see what the limitations of the lens are. And by those findings or what those limitations are, it, it gives you the knowledge uh, or the, let's say like an archive of knowledge from your various tests of what you can use to problem solve. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of knowledge to be had. There's so many different lenses. There's so many, like it's hard to, yeah eventually have that rolodex in your head but yeah, yeah but i mean uh, most of us are visual learners you know i think dps are visual learners and once that's baked in once you see it and maybe you're pixel people on the computer um which is really diving into it but once you see it it really backburns into your you know your film stock in your brain it, it's there and um you know if you're looking for a particular look like a particular flare or particular like maybe ghost flares or like you know a bit of veiling or something happening on you remember what that lens was and you say ah oh, i remember it was like this or um 
maybe the, the director wants a, a particular color flair. So you remember the coatings and I mean, again, I, I talked about yesterday, I think the most important thing too as a DP is finding brands that will collaborate. Brands that will open up, um, show you the open door and talk about their products and, and dive into the back end of their research and development and explain why they did something. Um, because not just from your testing, your findings, it's important to know why the manufacturers did this and why it puts a certain brand into different categories. Because again, that will make you, uh, I mean, we all know the cook look as we just talked about now. Uh, they've always got this consistency of a nice creamy texture in their films. And I always notice as well, um, whenever something shot on cook, even if you don't know it's shot on cook, you can notice because of the, the iris blades, there's a particular shape in the bokeh. Mm. Um, Again, that's a characteristic that you'll always, oh, you'll go back and get, yeah, that's cook. Um, so, yeah, I think testing and, and the collaboration of brands, getting involved with brands and, and people like Advanced Media. Yeah. Um, they're open with quite their brands and you, you can jump in any time, you know, so. Yeah, I think there's a lot to, uh, you know, it, it's visual, but it's also a lot actually doing with your own hands and experimenting with it mm. uh, really helps you. Uh, pick up all that knowledge. I mean, yeah. and, and if you're working with a team, get your team involved too, because then you're all together on the same bunch. And when you're on set and those problems happen or those creative decisions happen, you can all look at each other and you're like, remember this, remember that. And you know, you're all jump in and, and make the decision collectively. So yeah, I, I think testing is like, it's important. Um, don't be afraid of it, you know, just jump in. Do you feel like maybe young cinematographers maybe uh, try to play it safe sometimes and stick to lenses that they're used to? Do you think like most of them don't tend to, you know, step out of their comfort zone? Do you think that's something maybe um, it's... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, you know, I, I was a youngin once. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, you follow the trends, you know, you see your your favorite DPs or favorite directors or something and they've used this lens and then, oh, I'm all about that brand. And yeah. especially in this region, they're all about the brands, yeah. right? Um, uh, like I was just in IBC um, talking to uh, Gecko Cam, mm. um, who their lens sets are half a million dollars. And I said, why didn't you bring stuff to the Middle East? And they mentioned that in the Middle East themselves, it's very brand orientated. People don't really want to listen to the science. It's all about being attached to a brand, you yeah. know, like owning a Mercedes or something like that. In saying that, a week later, Gamma bought two sets of geckos yeah. <laughs> from Gecko Cam. So there are Gecko Cam lenses in the Middle East really? now. Really? Um, the first and the only. But, um, but yeah, uh, I, I think that's one, one thing that people follow here, at least. Mm. Um, being, I lived in Finland nine years and being in Australia as well, coming from Australia. I think um, we're more a little bit more open. Um, you'll see a lot more different vintage lenses used. There's some crazy stuff that comes out of Russia with fungus from wherever maybe COVID <laughs> came from it. Who knows? But, um, you know, it all causes alterations to the image and, and unique um, imperfections, which, you know, might work for the story. And I think also um, we have access, I think, abroad to uh, a little bit healthier communities, film communities. I think that's one great thing about being part of ACS is that you're in a film community with some of the world's, you know, greatest winning Oscar cinematographers, you know, and um, when you go there to headquarters, you can just be hanging out, having a beer, and they'll just tell you stuff from set that you'll never hear from a book or from, from any schooling or anything like that. And these little word of mouth things is where you, you kind of, oh, maybe you should try that, maybe you should try that, and you'll never hear about it. And I mean, um, we all know Greg, Greg Frazier, ACS, AC, um, Australian cinematographer as well. His last couple of films, he's been using some wild lenses out of Ukraine. You know, he's been using uh, FX3s, FX6s. Like what? Big films. Like which films? Uh, he just did uh, Creator. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, Batman. He shot with yeah, some crazy yeah, yeah. Ukrainian uh, Jupiters, like, you know, like stuff that you could just get online that are accessible to indie yeah. filmmakers, you know. Yeah, Creator was crazy. It was um, shot on a, on, on a Sony. Three, FX3, like, yeah. FX6. Yeah, they had some time code <laughs> issues, but I mean, they used in the FX series, you know. So, um, again, someone that sees an $80 million or $200 million film, they think, oh, i got to shoot on Anamorphics. i got to shoot on like a $32,000 cook or something. Um, but no, like, don't be just attached to the brand or the price tag. Yeah. Actually go, again, do your tests. What works for the image? What works for that sequence maybe? Um, you know, uh, I, we talked about a film I did a couple of years ago and we used the the Sentry uh, tilt, tilt swing lens because it's got the bellows. And, Again, it worked for a dream sequence. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's a choice. It's a choice. And you wouldn't hear about that here. I don't think there is a century lens here at all. 
no one would know about it. It's but not a brand. That's the thing. You just got to dive into it. You know. Yeah, and I think I mean I mean if you look if you look regionally, not just in the UAE, if you look regionally, there is a lot of experimentation happening with independent films and low budget films. Yeah. But here specifically, yeah, it is geared more towards commercial, and there's a lot of money to spend, and I guess they go up. But you know, the creator is such a cool example because when you watch that film. It looks like a hundred fifty million dollar film when it's actually. Oh, and there's a huge yeah. post production yeah. budget yeah. <laughs> attached, but I mean, again, yeah, the the right tool for the job, yeah. and um, again, the decision might not be based on look; it might be based on your operating needs. You know, yeah. maybe your operation needs to be very fast, quick, and sleek. You need to be changing lenses fast, so you opt for something that fits that that choice. You know. How, where do you think we're going? <laughs> where do you think the future of cinematography and optics is going? What technology should we be keeping an eye out for? Well, I mean, uh, there's always the thing that, you know, modern lenses now, um, we've got uniform front diameters, uh, you know, uniform sizes, weights, you know, that modern, modern lenses have kind of all come into unity, if you want to call it, mm. um, which makes working with them good. But when I look at the future, and I look at um, what some brands are doing in other sensors now, like um, now there is a smart ND filters that can adjust themselves based on calculations and computers. That's um, crazy. Uh, Red have their new optical stack filter that's put all their filters that they used to have, their oil PFs, and put it into one. And it's reacting and creating palettes of color, cal calculating it within the computer. So then, and even diffusion now, they've got variable diffusions, you know, changing light, altering light. So that comes to me and I'm thinking, okay, um, soon it's going to come to an alteration of a lens coating. I'm pretty sure, and it might be already in the works, or maybe it's out there. If it is, someone told me, um, there might be a, an alteration or some sort of AI coming out where you can choose the lens coating that you want on the fly. And either it does something physically, mechanically within the lens or, you know, in front of your sensor, or it's a calculation based thing like Red's optical stack filter and it's, it's um, architecture inside the camera. So I think that's where we're heading. Um, I mean, AI, know, AI is getting Yeah, into I everything. mean, like coatings, uh, you know, coatings are a great thing. It, it gives us different flares or, it, you know, reduces flow, all these kind of stuff. But, um, you know, it's food for fungi. Maybe taking coatings away removes a lot of these things. Um, and we do it digitally or, you know, based on AI and then maybe it's mechanically fitted with some sort of AI architecture. I'm not sure, but I really think that's where it's going. Um, that, that's just me, you know, sitting down and speculating, but I can, I can see it cause it's happening in diffusions. Now it's happening in uh, neutral density filters. So I think that's where we're going to be heading some sort of AI coding on lenses. And if someone's listening to this and starts designing it, I want to be involved. Oh, no, you better make some commission <laughs> off of that. Yeah, I want to be involved. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think that could be where we're headed. So AI integration. Yeah. Um, in your own personal journey, uh, and it's a, it's a quite an impressive journey, um, what are the key moments, do you think, for you as a cinematographer where you really found yourself changed or found yourself developed or certain experiences that have really shaped who you are right now, especially with your relationship with cameras and lenses? I really honestly think it's got nothing to do with uh, cinema. I think uh, as a cinematographer, um, of course, there's the, the tech side you really need to be savvy of and understand your tools. But I think uh, expressing that, that helps you push um, its life experiences and um, you know, I've, people that know me know I've been through some crazy stories, uh, especially when I lived in Europe and such. But, I, you know, the biggest push for me, I think, was, um, you know, the leap of faith of jumping into cinematography full time, not relying on any other source of income but this, um, you know, being broke and poor. <laughs> I had a really bad breakup and I was like literally eating ketchup, you know, from bottles. Um, at some point in my life, you know, I had no money, but mm. that, um, I think that drive, of course, for survival and going through those experiences along the journey and the hustle, um, and traveling as well. Traveling is one of the biggest things that contributes to, to how you see the world, um, and how you apply that in your imagery. Through your own actual lens. Exactly. Cause I mean, human lens. <laughs> you, you know, you might be on set and you're trying to shoot something. You have your references, you've been given your references, but you might've been to a place and time in your life. Um, where light, you know, light really struck you and you remember, oh, it was like this, you know, um, and putting that into your imagery, I think it's a very important thing to have those life experiences because 
I've always said traveling is the best education that you can do, the best education. And just absorbing that, seeing different textures, seeing how light absorbs or reflects off a surface. What material was it? Was it gloss? Was it matte? Was it some plastic or something? Absorbing all that and just being observant um, from traveling or you know sitting in a restaurant and, and seeing these textures on a wall and see how light is reflecting or absorbing or something. Um, all that life experience applies in your visual and i think for me that that journey of traveling living abroad in scandinavia for for nine years and you know i mean i was shooting in china and new zealand i've been everywhere but that all um that all gets absorbed into your brain and applies to your to your vision I, i'm grateful that i had those opportunities and the people that were along along the way that opened up doors for me i'm, I'm very uh, thankful for that so yeah traveling uh has helped a lot see the world see see the world and uh, Again, from that, put yourself out of the comfort zone. Yeah. People um, perform better, I think. It's that survival instinct when you're out of the comfort zone. Wow. Thank you, Mark. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, and on that uh, note, uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in to uh, the launch of Advanced Media's podcast with the special series uh, coinciding with the return of Cine Tomorrow. Advanced Media is presenting four other episodes in this series. Make sure to check them out. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Razan. And I am Razan Takash, and thank you for tuning in.